When I first started this channel, my first several videos were a series that I called the Android Security Crash Course. And it was basically just a bunch of videos where I was going through a lot of the tools and techniques that I use when I test Android applications for security vulnerabilities. And I actually have a playlist of all those videos on my channel if anyone wants to check that out. But some of them were pretty simple, like how to set up an Android emulator using Android Studio, and some of them were a bit more complex, like how to bypass SSL pinning. A couple of those videos were how to use a tool called Burp Suite with an Android device. During those videos, I gave a brief overview of what Burp Suite is, how it works, what you can do with it, but I wanted to give a little bit more of insight on how you can use Burp Suite to test not only Android applications or mobile applications in general, but also web applications, which is what it was originally built for. Also, for anyone who might be a student or trying to break into the application security industry, if you stick around to the end of the video, I'll talk about something that you might be able to do to bolster your resume and make yourself stick out a little bit more when you're applying for any of those entry-level jobs. So the first thing you want to do when you're learning about Burp Suite is you obviously need to download Burp Suite. So you just go to portswigger.net and you can download the Burp Suite Community Edition, which is free. They also have a professional edition, which has a license that you have to pay for. I would probably just stick to the community edition because it's going to have pretty much everything you need to do what you want to do. Once you have Burp Suite downloaded and you go through the little setup wizard, you can then launch to Burp Suite. It'll bring up this little box right here. I'm just going to do a temporary project. So I'm going to hit next and I'm going to start burp and then it will open up this page where it has all the different tabs for burp and the different things you can do. Now I could go through all of the different tabs and try to show you all the different functions that burp suite has, but Portswigger already has some great resources on their web security academy at their website where they walk you through how to use all the different features of Burp Suite and how to use those tools to test web applications for security vulnerabilities. If we take a look at Learning Path, it has a bunch of different topics that it covers and the labs associated with them. And they just recently added a section on JSON web token attacks. So they're always adding new content. But if you just want to start at the top and go to SQL injection, it gives you all this information about what SQL injection is and how you can exploit it and why it's a problem. And then as you're reading this information, it will occasionally present you with a lab that you can click on and try to solve the lab and then go right back to the lesson and continue learning on the topic that they're explaining. But for this video, I'm just going to take a look at the cross-site scripting topic and I'm going to go through a couple of the labs just to show you how it works. You don't have to have an account in order to read through all of the learning paths and all of the information and blogs and everything that they have on Web Security Academy, but I'm pretty sure you do have to have an account in order to complete the labs. It is free to make an account though, so I think it's worth it to make one, and the labs are really good practice and a great way to learn how to do this kind of stuff. But right now I'm taking a look at the cross-site scripting learning path and you can see that it has all this information where it says how does cross-site scripting work and it gives examples and then it goes into all the different types of cross-site scripting attacks and then you can go into more detail on reflected cross-site scripting for example and then that's when you can start getting to the lab and then you can move on to stored cross-site scripting but it also has this little button up here where you can just go straight to a listing of all of the labs and you can just go through them one at a time and try to solve them all. So if I take a look at the first lab right here under the cross-site scripting topic, it opens up this little lab, it has a description of it, and it has this little button right here where you can access the lab. And I typically will open this in another tab just to keep this page open in case I need to refer to these instructions at some point during the lab. So now when I access the lab, it opened this little website and another tab. And if I go back and look at the instructions, it says this lab contains a simple reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability in the search functionality. To solve the lab, perform a cross-site scripting attack that calls the alert function. So if we play with this little search function and try to figure out how it works, for example, let's do a search for test. When we run that search, we notice that at the top it says one search results for test. So this right here 
is the word that we put in the search function. So that is where we're going to get our reflection when we're looking for that reflected cross-site scripting. So if I put a script tag in here and hit the search, we can tell that something went wrong. For one, there's only one quote here, and also everything below that did not get populated. So something broke when I put that script tag. Now I'm gonna actually put that alert JavaScript function in there. I'm gonna do alert one, and then I'm gonna close the script tag. And now if I hit search, it popped up an alert box with the number one, and I have solved the lab. Now you may have noticed that I didn't actually use Burp Suite at all for that lab. And for a lot of these, that will be the case. And especially in the early ones on each topic, you can a lot of times solve it without even using Burp. But if we did want to use Burp to solve this, we simply just open Burp and we can go to our proxy tab. There are a couple different ways you can use the proxy in Burp Suite. What used to be the most common way and is still very popular among a lot of people is you can go to the proxy tab and then the options tab and then export the certificate and then import that certificate into whatever browser you want to use whether that's firefox or chrome or whatever it is but a few years ago they actually added a new feature to burp where you can just click this button right here and it will open a chromium browser and this browser already has that certificate and everything set up for you. So I'm going to go back to this little blog site that we were testing and I'm going to copy that URL. I'm going to paste that URL in here. And now I can see the HTTP requests that were being sent when I went to that website in that Chromium browser. This time I'm going to do a script tag with alert 321. And then I close the script tag. And again, it pops up an alert box. This time it says 321. But if we go into our HTTP history, we can inspect the request and response and we can see why this is working the way it is. So right here in the search, you see here is our search term that we put in and it's been URL encoded. So all the brackets get changed to encoded characters, things like that. And if we look over at the response on the right side, we can see where it has the text zero search results for with a single quote. And then it has that text with the script tag and the alert 321, which is what we put in the search box. And it just copied one to one exactly what we put in the search box and dropped it in here. If this site was following best security practices, they would be doing some filtering and encoding and things like that. So we wouldn't be able to use the search function to just add our own code to the site. So now that I've done that first lab that was pretty simple, I'm gonna jump ahead to one that's a little bit more complex and we'll use Burp Suite a little bit more. And that's going to be the stored cross-site scripting into anchor href attribute with double quotes HTML encoded. That name just really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? So the instructions for this one says, this lab contains a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability in the comment functionality. To solve this lab, submit a comment that calls the alert function when the comment author name is clicked. Basically the way you can think of the difference between stored and reflected cross-site scripting is if I, the user, do this particular thing on this particular page, then cross-site scripting will occur. But if it's stored cross-site scripting, then an attacker can do something on a page that is vulnerable, and then every single other person in the world who goes to that page where they did that thing, cross-site scripting will occur to all of those people and not just the attacker who executed the actual cross-site scripting. That was a very fast and sloppy explanation. If you really wanna know more about it and how they work and what makes them different, go back to the learning path in the Web Security Academy. They explain things much better than I do. But getting back to the lab, it said that the comment functionality is vulnerable to stored cross-site scripting. So if we view a post, you'll see this comment field. If I want to leave some comments here. I'm just going to do test comment and then test name. And then this is probably going to require an email format. And then for the website field, I'm just going to do uh, test.com. So now if I post that comment, it says, thank you for your comment. If I go back to the blog, I now see that my comment has been posted. But you'll notice that 
the test name that I gave it, it is hyperlinked. And if I open that hyperlink, it goes to a not found page, but the URL that it went to goes to the same URL of the site slash test.com. And if you remember, test.com is what I put in the website field right here. So that means that whatever we put here is going to be hyperlinked right there. And if I go to Burp Suite, I can find the post request that actually posted my comment. So since this is the request that we want to play with, we can actually right click it and send it to repeater, which is another very useful function, especially for this kind of thing when you're trying to figure out how to bypass some filtering and try to figure out how to do some sort of injection or something like that. Because essentially what you can do is you can take a particular request and you can send it over and over again and you can change up what you're doing in the parameters and try to figure out something to get something interesting to happen on the response side. So now that we have our request in the repeater and we can play with it, we need one more bit of information. We need to know where this information, this test.com is going and how it's being handled. So let's go back to our HTTP history and we're gonna look at the get request that actually just opens this page that displays the comments, we can find our comment that we submitted. So we see test name, and here's that test.com that we submitted in the website field. So we can see what it's doing with that. It's just hyperlinking whatever this text is that we put in for the name field, and it's directly linking it to whatever we put in the website field. Something interesting to know about how JavaScript works is that there's actually a JavaScript keyword. If you put that JavaScript keyword in a URL and then follow it with a colon, it will attempt to execute whatever you put after that colon as if it was JavaScript. For example, if we put alert, which is a JavaScript function, and then again, let's say one, two, three, for example, and we send that request. Now, if we go back to this blog site and we refresh, we see that there are a few additional comments that have been posted because we have sent that request a few times with repeater. But if we look at the very bottom one and we hover our mouse over that test name, if you can see in the very bottom left corner of the browser, it actually says JavaScript colon alert one, two, three. And if we click this, it popped up an alert box and says one, two, three. And because our goal was to submit a comment that calls the alert function when the comment author name is clicked, we have now solved this lab. But those are just two examples of some of the labs under the cross-site scripting topic. And there are plenty of others and they get way more complicated and way more interesting. And you can go through all of them and then you can move on to other topics. There's a near endless amount of information and resources and things you can learn from this Web Security Academy if anyone is a student or just learning about application security or wanting to break into the industry. And to deliver on the promise that I made at the beginning of the video. If you are trying to get into the industry of application security, they actually offer a Burp Suite certificate. The certification only costs $99, which if you are just like a broke college student or something, you might be thinking that's a lot of money, which it is. But if you compare it to a lot of the other certifications out there that you might be considering to put on your resume, like for example, the CEH, the OSCP, any sort of SANS courses, which all of those are great certifications and are a good thing to have on your resume. Compared to just about every certification out there, $99 is incredibly cheap. I personally have worked for four different companies now doing application security and at every single one of them, if it wasn't the most, it was one of the most used tools in our entire toolkit. Every single application that I've tested for every single one of those companies, I've used Burp Suite as a large portion of my driver for how I tested for those vulnerabilities. I'm not sponsored by Burp Suite, but I think it might be worth a look if you can afford $99. And that could make you stand out compared to a lot of the other people out there applying for entry-level positions.